The 25th President of the United States, William McKinley, is dead. Shot at close range by a lone gunman, he's the third president to be assassinated. McKinley's successor is his vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, the youngest man ever to hold the office. And if his wife is a reluctant first lady, she'll be one of the most influential. The 20th century sees an explosion in newspapers and magazines, all fascinated by the first family. Oldest daughter Alice is a fixture in the gossip columns, and Edith's a calendar girl. The Roosevelts were a breath of fresh air when they came into the White House. Uh, like the Kennedys, they were a young family, and the public was fascinated by the antics of the children. Young Quentin, who was widely known as a scamp, was the head of what was called the White House Gang, and they got up to all sorts of mischief. They did spitballs at the presidential portraits once and got in some trouble for it with the president. One of the great stunts everyone remembers was the time when Archie was sick and young Quentin took Archie's pony, Algonquin, up in the White House elevator to the sick room upstairs. And of course, Archie got better instantly, so it worked. Edith tries to protect her children while satisfying the demand for photos and stories. It's a dilemma that will face all first moms to come. Every first family has to kind of grapple with how to protect their children's privacy and have a modicum of privacy for themselves. We had children that lived in the White House. And when they go out, because they are the president's family, people want photographs, they want to shake hands with him, you're surrounded. No matter what they've been through outside that White House, when they walk into it, this new life surrounds them. The White House is a great place to live but most all of them would give it up in a minute for freedom. But Edith has another pressing problem, the White House itself. The family are crammed into eight rooms on a floor they share with 30 office workers. Edith likened the White House when she moved in to living over the store. And she wanted to separate the living space from the workspace. So the presidential business was conducted elsewhere. Edith's wish for greater privacy leads to the creation of the famous West Wing. With the help of architects McKim, Mead, and White, Edith oversees the demolition of the old greenhouses to the west of the residence. The presidential staff moves out of the second floor and a colonnaded gallery rises, leading to a new office block. Inside is the president's office, cabinet room, and the secretary's office. The most famous room in America, the Oval Office, will be added when the building's extended seven years later. It's the biggest change to the White House in almost a century. And there are big changes inside the residence, too. If the White House isn't big enough for the Roosevelts, it's too small for the nation's aspirations. As America is approaching the role of, of world power, there is going to be a need for a larger state dining room. There is a need for grander reception rooms. The Roosevelts redesigned the first floor of the residence, knocking down the main staircase and expanding the state dining room to seat more than 100 guests at state dinners. They create a passage through the green, blue, and red rooms and build an east entrance for the growing number of official visitors. As for interior decor, Edith gives the White House a new look for a new age. <laughs> 